birds are necessarily bad, but uh, it, it goes, is my name written there? Um, I, like the, I like the attitude of this song more, that idea of my name is written there. It's not a question. There's not a question mark behind it. When you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, it isn't, will I make it there, or I hope I'm okay to get there, I hope they let me in, maybe they'll let me in. It is, my name is written there, right? And we're so thankful to know that. And we can have great confidence in that fact. That second verse of that song says, my sins, they were many, like the sands of the sea. In other words, I think the writer of the song understood that they were wicked and vile and that they were a sinner from the beginning, right? My sins were many like the sands of the sea, but the blood of my Savior is sufficient for me. For his promise is written in bright letters that glow, though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them like snow. Our, we were very wicked. We were steeped in sin, covered with it. Um, and the Lord Jesus Christ washed us white as snow. And we're thankful to know that he has done that. We appreciate your prayers as we've uh, tried to get ready for the services and uh, those that might be watching online for your prayers here for the mission work. Um, we're thankful that the Lord has blessed and allowed us to be able to be here. Uh, we're looking at different things that we can do. The weather's getting nice. We want to be out there. We want to be talking to people about the Lord, making sure that people know that we're here. Um, we want to be able to be an encouragement to people. Um, those that are saved, that we would be able to help them and disciple them, and those that are lost, that we'd be able to preach the gospel message to them. And uh, just continue to pray for the work here as we look for that opportunity. We're back in John chapter 16 again tonight. Uh, we are coming down to the end of the book. There's really, as you think about it, uh, we have covered a whole lot of ground. And starting from uh, the, the divine genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? A lot of the other gospels start with his physical genealogy. We like to think about John starting with his divine genealogy. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, we understand that, but we see his, uh, his public ministry and the calling of his uh, apostles and the miracles that he did to manifest where his authority came from. And now we're down here to this very personal teaching, one-on-one -on -one, uh, between the Lord Jesus Christ and his apostles uh, and his disciples, and he is teaching them and he's trying to get them to understand uh, that he's about to go. And that when he goes, they will have great sorrow and there will be much persecution and there's going to be a lot of trials and troubles and uh, all the way down to the point that people would even kill some of them claiming to be doing it in the name of God. And uh, he has tried to, even in the course of that, try to comfort them and encourage them with the peace that he alone can give and this idea that he's not going to leave them alone, right? Right? And in the course of some of this, he has given them some, uh, he calls them proverbs. He basically says here in John chapter 16, verse 25, These things have I spoken unto you in proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak to you in proverbs, but I will show you plainly of the Father. He says, you know what? I have taught you. I have, I have spoken to you of these things. And some of these things that I've taught you and some of these things that I've described, I've just had to do them in Proverbs. I've had to use this example of the woman with child and how she feels while she's going through it and how she feels at the end of it. And that's, that is a parallel of what your sorrow is going to be and what your joy is going to be whenever you see me risen and whenever you one day spend an eternity with me. But there's coming a day when it's not just going to be me teaching you and me describing you, but I will show you plainly the things of the Father. He says, And at that day you shall ask in my name, and I say unto you that I will, and I, I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you because he loved, because ye loved me, 
and have believed that I came out from God. And we talked this morning about the fact that in, in, in part of this, we see this idea that we are able to go before the Father with our prayers and our petitions. We can go to Him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and He will answer us. And we don't think much about that, unfortunately, because we just we take it for granted sometimes. But imagine that worthless, filthy, vile thing being able to come and stand at the throne of God and to be able to ask for things. It's actually a very amazing thing to think that we, that were once completely un, unworthy and unrighteous, to be able to stand in the presence of the Lord. Now one day, right now, we can go to Him in prayer. We can go to Him with our petitions. But there is coming a time where we will physically stand before God. Now, again, I want you kids to think about that for a minute. Because historically, as you look at the Scriptures, people couldn't even look upon God. He's just so righteous and so holy we couldn't even look upon Him. And yet there's coming a time when we will spend an eternity in His presence. And there is nothing that anybody can do to us to take that joy away from us. We know where we're going and we know what's coming. Now, just like the apostles um, sorrowed and had some travail to go through and then they would see the risen Savior physically, right? Right? Well, you and me, we, the Savior has moved in our hearts. He's redeemed us. He's saved us. We look back and know that He is risen. We know that He's living. We may be going through some trials and troubles and slights of men and mockery in this world. But do you know there's coming a time when that trump will sound? And we will see him face to face. There's coming a time, just like the apostles got to see him after he was risen. There's coming a time when we will be in his presence as well. And so I don't want you to just think about these verses. I understand a lot of these verses are to the apostles to some degree. And we see them fulfilled in the book of Acts and other places. But it's not just that. These verses absolutely apply to us as we think about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that He's preparing a place for us and He's coming again and uh, the fact that He sent us the Comforter and all of these things, these are absolutely for us as well. And then we want to pick up here uh, in verse 29, uh, back up a couple of verses. For the Father Himself loved you, loveth you because you have loved me and I have believed and have believed that I am come out from God. I came forth from the Father and am come unto the, world, uh, unto the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Now, verse 28, kids, think about this, adults. We want to think about the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ here is saying, He said it over and over and over in the book of John. Where did He come from? Where did Jesus Christ come from? He came from the Father. Where's the Father? Well, the Father's back in glory. The Father's in heaven. The Father is... So where'd He come from? In other verses in John, He says, I am the bread from heaven. I want you to remember, in some of these final words of the Lord Jesus Christ, He is once again saying, I am not of this world. Jesus did not begin when He was born of Mary. I came from the Father and I came to this world. In other words, I was somewhere else first and I came to this world. And then he talks about the fact that he's maybe he, not maybe, that he's he came into this world and again I leave the world. He's telling them, I came from the Father, and I specifically came to the world 
to fulfill a purpose. He'd already told them time and time again, I came to fulfill the will of the Father. I came to fulfill His commands. I came to speak the words which He wanted me to speak. And He's telling His apostles, I've completed that. I've done those things. And now it's time for me to leave the world. Just as I once came, now I'm leaving. If you didn't get it in the first three chapters of this dialogue between them, I'm leaving. And I'm going back where I came from. I'm going back to the Father. And you'll understand a little bit more here in John chapter 17. Jesus Christ uses this terminology about uh, the glory that he once had. Do not let people tell you that Jesus Christ was born into this world and that that's when he started and that when he died that was his end. Jesus Christ specifically taught, no, I, I was from before <laughs> and I'm going back to be in my rightful place. Now it's interesting when you get down to verse 29, his disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. I love it. <laughs> it's so funny. Because he's saying, hey, look, I know I'm speaking to you in Proverbs, but there's coming a day when I will show you plainly. And their response to that was, what do you mean you're speaking in Proverbs? You're not speaking in Proverbs now. You, you're speaking plainly. And we get it. We get it. And, and to some degree, they, they, and to some degree they did. Um, I mean, a few verses ago, he was talking about how they believed that he came from God. And in John chapter 17, when we get into the prayer, uh, he again says that, you know, that you've given them to me and that they've believed my word. And so, yes, to some degree they did. Their answer is, now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Now it's interesting to me at this point, remember what's the context of what just happened. They had a lot of questions. They didn't understand what he was saying. They wanted to ask him, but they didn't. And even though they didn't voice their concerns, even though they didn't voice the questions they had, he knew what they were thinking. And he actually went to them and said, this is what you're thinking. This is the question you have. Let me help explain it to you. Now, if I'm sitting here looking, and since he's looking at me so intently, Elliot might have a lot of questions about what I'm saying. Now, how impressed would he be if I just simply looked at him and this is a little scary. If I could say exactly what's going through his head right now without him having to tell me. Oh, Sierra got nervous when I said that. What do you think about that, Joe? Oh, if I could, if I could look at you and say, well, this is what you're thinking right now. Or maybe I should ask some of the adults in the room. Huh? What do you think if I could look at you and I could know the thoughts of your heart? That's exactly what Jesus Christ did to the disciples. He looked at them and he knew where they were getting tripped up. He knew what was on their mind. He knew they wanted to ask but didn't have the courage to do so. And after he looked at them and said, well, this is what you're thinking and this is what you're struggling with and let me expand on it a little bit more, they came back and said, now are we sure that thou knowest all things? <laughs> you have once again shown us that you know all things. And needest not that any man should ask thee. I think you can take this a couple ways. I think look at Jesus Christ and, and he knew all things without any man having to be involved, right? The, a lot of the rabbis and these other guys, they would say what they thought the scripture meant or they would say what they think this means or they would might debate amongst themselves to come to what they thought the conclusion needed to be. Jesus Christ knew all things and needed no man to tell him 
or to ask him. He didn't need anything like that. But I think in this case, you can even think back to where what just happened. They didn't have to voice their thoughts. They didn't have to voice the things that were on their mind. It's like the woman at the well. Do you remember what happened to her? He knows. He knows, and I didn't ever tell him. You think about the people... You think about the people that saw him feed 5,000, saw him heal the lame man, the blind man, and all this stuff. And by the end of the passage, they just wanted to stone him. But then you think about that woman at the well who simply, when Jesus Christ spoke to her, and he knew her. They said, we know, we know that you know all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. This is yet one more thing that shows us you came from God, and we know it, and we believe it. That's pretty cool. Jesus Christ has already said multiple times in these few chapters, I'm telling you this so that when it happens, you'll believe. I'm telling you this so that when it happens, you won't be offended. I'm telling you this ahead of time so that you'll know that I'm doing the will of the Father. All of these things are being done to build their faith. Now, I look at these men and I believe they were already saved. I believe these men were already believers. These men were not saved later I believe these men were already saved. And so you can say, well, how is it that suddenly there's this declaration that now they believe? Well, even you and me, our faith, our faith grows. We see the Lord work and we go, wow, I knew it, but man, now I really know it. I knew he could answer this prayer about us being able to stay in this facility, but now he's actually done it and he has just strengthened my faith that much more. Now it's interesting because as you look at this next verse, and this can be a little bit sad, but I think it's also a good reminder for us. I love their enthusiasm in verse 29 and verse 30. And I'm not even gonna take I'm not even gonna take it away from them because even the Lord backs up some of what they say in the next chapter. But I also want you to notice that the Lord looks at them and says, Do ye now believe? And there is a question mark at the end of that statement. The Lord Jesus Christ is about to give his life and die on the cross. And he knows that these people, the closest to him, the ones that have heard his teachings the most, the ones that have just openly declared, we know you're from God and we believe. Jesus Christ is going to do the work that he's about to do already knowing that these very people are going to abandon him. Because they just openly declare, we know you're from God and we believe. And he says, do you? Do you really? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered every man to his own and shall leave me alone. The grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ is amazing. You and me, we can do good things for other people. It's kind of hard sometimes. We can even occasionally do good things for people that may not, we may feel like they don't deserve it. There have been people in this life that have even given their life for others. But Jesus Christ bore our sins and paid for our sins. The holy, righteous, perfect Son of God took upon Himself our sins and died for our sins at a point where we really wanted nothing to do with Him. It isn't that we gave ourselves to Him and therefore He gave His life for us. He gave himself for us when we were still the enemy. And even his friends were about to abandon him 
and he did it anyways. You think about the sorrow that the apostles are about to go through, but think about Jesus Christ for a minute. In these few chapters, and this is one evening, I, some people don't believe this, but I believe this is one evening, okay? He proclaims that Judas is going to betray him. He declares that Peter is going to deny him. And now, he, and now he has openly declared that all of them will abandon him. Now, how many of them do you think were sitting there going, well, one of us is going to deny him. It's not me. Or one of us is going to uh, betray him. That's not me. I'm good there, I think. Uh, man, but did you hear Peter? Peter's going to deny him. <laughs> I always knew Peter wasn't as good as he said he was. And you've been listening to the rest of Jesus' teaching, and now you've boldly and confidently declared, I believe you. And the response that you get back is, do you? Do you really? Because in the next few hours, you're actually going to abandon me. And you're going to leave me alone. And I'm going to suffer alone. I think it's a good reminder that we need to be careful. We need to be bold in our declaration of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we need to be really careful that we're not leaning on our own strength and our own abilities. Because just around the corner, before the day is over, it could be that we're running in fear. Do you? Do you now believe? Do you? Do you really? Do you know that I'm from God? You almost get the idea that he's saying, look, I, I get it. I, I know you believe in me. <laughs> but you've still got some growth that you need. You've still, got some, you've still got to build your faith. Because there's coming a time, matter of fact, we're already here, where you're going to leave me. He goes on in verse 32 and says, And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. He knows and he looks ahead and he knows this mob is coming. He knows that they're going to try to take him. He even knows that Peter's going to maybe stand up and cut an ear off here or there. But in the end, even though there's that zeal at first, in the end, they all scatter. And he says, I'm going to physically be left alone without a friend, without an ally, without somebody to be of aid to me. But he can look at them and say, but it's okay, because I'm, I won't be alone because the Father is with me. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. You know, we understand the father and the, and the the father and the son have a relationship that I don't I can't I can't really fathom and understand if I'm honest, right? Um, but I also understand that to some degree we can claim some of this too. Because we may be here in this world and we may come to a point when I'm in need and nobody in this room is here. Maybe even some of you, for one reason or another, maybe I should reverse it. Maybe you're in need, and I'm cowering somewhere in fear, not being of an aid and help to you. But you are not alone. The Lord Jesus Christ's promise to us was that he would not leave us alone. If you are one of the Lord's, then he is with you. Now, you may not escape whatever it is that you're going through, but He is with you. And one of those last things He does in this life may be to bear you over the River Jordan, right? You may, you may not make it out of this life. James was touched by the sword, but I firmly believe that James knew all the way even to the end that the Lord was with him. Jesus says, I may be alone, but I'm not alone because the Father 
is with me. He says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So you say, well, what is the point of all this conversation? He sums it up here in this last verse of chapter 16. He's saying, look, I've told you all of these things about the suffering you're going to go through, this analogy about the woman and how she's bearing a child and she's in great anguish, but then she's going to be filled with joy. And I've told you that the same is coming for you. You're going to be filled with sorrow and grief and toil. But here in a little bit, you'll understand more plainly because I'm going to show you some things that you probably weren't expecting. There's coming a time when he's going to be raised from the dead and that guy they saw hang on the cross, that person they knew died and has physically been buried and dead in the grave for three days is going to be standing and speaking to them. And he says, I'm telling you all of these things and I'm telling you the fact that... Peter's going to deny me. You're all going to abandon me. But I'm not going to be alone, just like I'm not going to leave you alone. And I'm telling you all of these things that you might have my peace while you're in this world. Listen, people, it is not that we will one day have the peace of God. He says, I want you to have the peace in God. I want you to have the peace now. The world is going to bring what? Tribulation. These two things can exist at the same time. And that's what people don't understand. Through Him, we can have peace. In the world, we will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, they had seen him do some things that were amazing. At the point that he tells them, I have overcome the world, they actually haven't seen the depth of how much he overcame it yet. Within a few days, they will see what he means by overcoming the world. Can you imagine... You guys know what happens next, right? Hung on a cross, died, buried, rose again. We know that because we've read it. You imagine the picture that that brings in their mind when Jesus Christ, they remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ after they have seen him raised from the dead and after they've been told to go wait. You think back, can, I, I don't know what they were thinking. But man, would they have went back to this conversation and said, oh, yeah, wow, he has overcome the world. An angry mob murdering him and putting him in a tomb, and yet he still conquers even that. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one that they had chosen to serve, the one that they had chosen to follow, the one that was their Messiah, and they knew it, and they knew he came from God, they could look at that and say, not even death can conquer him. People hated him. They despised him. They mocked him. They tried to make false accusations against him. And in all of that, he kept doing the will of the Father. He kept serving God. He didn't fall. He didn't fall into temptation. He didn't jump into temptation. But he kept right on doing the will of the Father. Kept right on. Even down to the point where his own disciples betrayed him, denied him, and abandoned him. He kept right on doing the will of the Father. Kept right on following And he's saying, I'm doing this, and I'm telling you this, that you might take strength in the fact that I have overcome. We pattern our life after the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to pattern ourselves after the Lord Jesus Christ. What pattern did he give us? 
Do the will of the Father. Keep going. Keep serving. Move forward. Even if somebody betrays you, even if somebody denies you, even if somebody abandons you, just keep right on following the Lord. Keep right on doing the work that the Lord sent you to do. You know, we believe as Baptists that if you're saved, you will overcome, right? You will persevere. We don't believe that if you get down to the end and you did a good enough job, that's persevering. And now we know you're one of His. We believe that if you are one of His, you will persevere. You'll trip, you'll fall, you'll get dirty on the way. But if you're one of the Lord's, you will, you'll persevere. You will follow Him. You won't deny Him and claim that there is no Savior and go off and just live the rest of your life like there is no God. I believe that. Now there's times in our life where we get off track. We need to be chastised. We need to be reminded. We may even get to the point where he might just take us home. But if you've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you will never forget that. It's not something that happens and then you can lose it. We serve an overcomer. I'm thankful to know that he has set that pattern for us. But I love the fact here that he tells us, look, I've told you all this, that you might have peace. <laughs> well, thanks for telling me that people were going to try to kill me in your name. And now you're telling me you told me that, that I might have peace? He says, no. He says, you can take cheer. You can have faith. You can have peace because you know that I have overcome. It's not about what I've done, me personally, John Alls. It's not about what I've done or what I can do. It's the fact I can have peace because I know the one I serve has overcome. Now, we're not going to get into it. We'll probably just close a little bit early um, but as you look over into chapter 17, I want you to notice this. Jesus Christ has just said all of these things. He's been teaching them. He's been teaching them. He's been teaching them. He's told them he's leaving. He's told them it's going to get bad. He's told them he's going back to the Father. He's told them, I've said all of this that you can overcome or that, that you can have peace because I've overcome. He immediately goes from that into these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. O oh, now, O oh, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was." I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Now we're... Next week, we'll keep going and we'll cover some of these verses that I just read and we'll go through the rest of the chapter. Jesus Christ, I just think I don't want you to end with this question that Jesus asked them. Do you really, do you believe, do you? You're going to abandon me. But I want you to have peace because I've overcome the world. And then he turns and he looks up to heaven and he prays to the Father and he talks about the hours come and it's time for me to go. Restore me to the, my rightful place. Take me back to that spot of glory that I came from. I've done your work. I've done the things that you've laid out for me to do. 
and I've given your word to these men that you gave me, and they've heard it, and they believe it. They did believe. Did they still have growing to do? Did they still have some things they were going to struggle with? Did they still have a pretty dark time ahead? Yeah. But Jesus Christ here says, Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. So even, even with Jesus' questioning, do you believe you're going to abandon me? He knew that in their heart they believed who he was and that they had accepted the fact and believed that he had come from the Father. It was time for him to go, but he had prepared these ones to serve him. We're thankful to know that he has opened our eyes and that he has showed us who he is. And our job now is to go out and do the will of the Father. We're supposed to tell others about what Jesus Christ has done for us. We're supposed to go out and do the work that the Lord gave us to do. And part of that work is declaring the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ baptizing those that are saved, teaching and discipling them that they might grow and that they might in turn go do the same thing. That's what we're called to do. Might we, may we do that. Let's pray for each other that we might have faith, step out, do the work, and like Jesus Christ, that we might know that we can overcome. Now in our case, not because of our own strength, but because the one we served has overcome. We can also be overcomers. All right, Brother Philip, would you come and lead us in a song, please?